right now, it's Steven Zeiler, the best dressed man at the conference. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. I think we have a minute if you want to stand up and stretch. I know we've seen a lot of uh, talks, so take a, um, one minute. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, um, thank you. So hello, my name is Steven Zeiler. The future of politics is an increased irrelevance of state politics in our lives as market, markets and technology begin to break down monopolies that our society has relied on for a long time to provide a lot of services that we really need in our communities. And um, <clears throat> I, so a friend of mine the other day, he was in East Austin and he, he was feeling chest pain. He, was, he thought he was having a heart attack and he thought, um, the first thing he thought was, I'm having a heart attack, I need to call 911. And the second thought he had was, I need to get to the hospital a lot faster than 911 can get me, so he, he called an Uber instead, and he had the Uber take him to the hospital. Um, fortunately, he wasn't having a heart attack, but he got there a lot faster. <clears throat> and today I want to talk about several of the sectors of the economy that, um, that are being replaced, the state monopolies are being replaced by market-based solutions and talk about a vision for how, how we might break down more state monopolies with different market solutions. And in three sectors in particular that we've often seen a, a large state monopoly. So the first one is providing defense and police and assistance in the community um, for uh, we are essentially subject to a, a monopoly in, in police services and assistance where people in the culture always call 911 if they need help. If there's danger, they call the police. And the police are a, um, everyone is compelled to pay for the police, whether you agree with the laws that they enforce or not. Um, if you're compelled to pay for it, and you're compelled to pay for their, their courts. Um, even if you think that nonviolent crimes may not be crimes at all, uh, you still have to pay for the, the police force that enforces that. The, the second, the second um, part of the economy that's a huge thing that most people haven't really thought about replacing with market solutions is um, law itself and courts and the provision of law itself. And we've seen over basically the history of law, really, there's state law and then there's private contractual law. And contract law is, is slowly replacing uh, monopolistic state law, but we'll um, see maybe better ways of approaching that. And then finally, the, the mega monopoly of all time is the monopoly in money the state granted monopoly for, um, for fiat currency. That's um, <clears throat> in the United States, it's the Federal Reserve System. They have, um, they have a monopoly on the provision of money. So um, starting with the police, there are a lot of um, areas in the, in the place, in the, sorry, in the country where police are not very good to their communities. We've seen this all over the news. Um, in, in different places, police are separate from the actual people and they're, they're enforcing rules that the people don't even want to be enforced at all. And the reason is we have external interests that are compelling us to pay for the police. And 
the problem is we can't take the money, like if there was a police, okay, sorry, I'll back up. I want private police forces and competition in police. A lot of people, when I bring that up, they ask, what's gonna happen if a private police force uh, takes all their guns and everything and creates a mafia? Um, everyone's always worried about a mafia for some reason when I bring up uh, private police forces. And um, the great part about competition in police is that if there's a police force that is, is um, hurting your rights, it's violating your, your community members' rights, people can stop subscribing to that police force and immediately begin subscribing to another police force that might um, uphold their rights or protect their community. Right now, we have no exit. We can't stop subscribing to the police. We have to use um, the, the political system in order to attempt to change the, the state police, the monopoly police. So there are places in the country who, that are shifting away from this model. And um, in particular, one example that I, I want to talk about is in Detroit. In Detroit, if you know, there's a lot of breakdown of what used to be a large city, a large state with a lot of monopoly services. And if you call the police in Detroit, they're not going to show up for a long time. Um, depending on which neighborhood you live in, they will never show up. And our culture has been accustomed to, to dialing 911 for a lot of different things. Um, and it's, there's a, now a problem with police coming and being very violent and not being accountable um, because we don't have a market solution for withdrawing funds from those police agencies. In Detroit, there are competing providers of security. There's a company, there are several companies, most prominently Threat Management Center, which is a, um, it's a threat de-escalation service where you, you call them up instead of the police and they're based in your community. They have advanced communication techniques. You actually pay them, you subscribe to their service and they, they're, they're specifically trained in de-escalation of, of violent scenarios and they don't, they wear armor but they don't bring weapons. They're not, they're not there to use violence. They're there uh, specifically to de-escalate um, the situation. And one thing that I find most interesting about the, the Detroit Threat Management Center um, solution, that's, it's market-based, there are alternatives, is people are choosing to pay for that in addition to being forced to pay for the monopoly police force. So we all live under uh, taxation. And <clears throat> a lot of people ask me, well, how, if, we, if we live in this, um, this monopoly police system now, how are we ever going to get to a free market of, of security without totally destroying um, like justice and, and security? And the answer for a lot of communities is paying for both. Um, the people who need it the most, they can't, they can't afford not to have their own private, private uh, security. Um, in Detroit, for instance, and a lot of companies here, they hire their own private security to protect their buildings because the monopoly police aren't effective enough at it. Um, and so <clears throat> increasing market-based solutions and um, I think specifically community-driven where like the values of the police are more reflect of the general customers in a community. I would love to see that. Um, lots of people also ask me, well, the police that we have now, they, they don't, when, when they see a robbery, for instance, they don't go up to the, the criminal and ask, do you have a subscription to my police service? Or the victim, sorry. Do you have a subscription to our police service before helping them? They generally go and, and try to help. Um, and so what, how, do we, how do we make sure that private police protect people who can't afford, um, aff afford police? Uh, I think a great solution to this would be insurance against crime for your neighborhood or your city where people could, could purchase insurance voluntarily that would, that would help pay for police, we would pay for cameras if necessary, pay for um, all kinds of other things. 
the key part that I, I want to emphasize here is we, um, a change in culture where people don't automatically call this one central authority for, for, um, for assistance. Um, you see people all over the country calling police for all kinds of random things. And you see videos, terrible violence happens because there's misunderstandings, they're calling the wrong agency. We can provide real assistance to our community members without having a, a course of monopolistic organization. <clears throat> okay, um, I like, if, if anyone's not following or you think I'm totally wrong, go ahead and ask questions while I'm talking. Um, I'll have, take questions at the end too. So who here has been to court? Anyone been to court? All right, um, actual, actually been, have you been prosecuted? <laughs> Okay, a couple people. Well, um, just like we have a um, monopolistic police system um, here in, in this country, there's also an even more monopolistic court system and law system. Um, who has written a contract with someone else? A good few people. A lot of people have contracts, employment contracts, and in, in almost every contract, it's almost implied that if there's a disagreement in the contract, that the state court will handle the disagreement. Um, this may not be true of, of all corporations, but the default is the, the state court that claims jurisdiction will handle this disagreement. And because we have, we are coerced to pay for the state court, it's not a it's not a business that is reliant on customers continually subscribing to their service and they are not very subject to the, the will of the people, um, if you will. I mean, we have life-term judges that can decide rules for entire populations. These are not people that are really subject to accountability or oversight of their customers. And they very often enforce laws that are not desirable for the vast majority of the community. And <clears throat> a lot of disagreements come to state courts because no one specified an additional arbitrator or an arbiter, a private service that will judge for you. And fortunately, we're actually a lot further along than, than private police or, or uh, competitive police forces. In, in law, we have a lot of competing arbiter services all over the world. Companies, companies will use, um, they'll write a contract, and instead of delegating disagreement to the state court, they will delegate to a third party arbiter. And they will say, we, we bind ourselves to whatever this arbiter says, um, if there's a disagreement. So for instance, if there was a, if you have an employment agreement with someone, you're an employee, they are an employer, rather than um, delegating to the state court. We could start taking market share away from the state court by specifying an arbitration agency that might get involved and begin to take market share from these monopolistic organizations. This wasn't very possible before when we didn't have instant global communication, we didn't have instant access to information or the ability to transmit value over the internet, but now we have a lot of technology that can, that can replace the need for, or, or this, the seeming need for state courts, for monopoly courts at all. Um, so if we stop using, we stop thinking about calling 911, some people can begin to use new police systems. We stop thinking about default contracting with the state for arbitration and we actually specify our own arbitration agencies we can start to replace these monopolistic organizations. Okay, any questions about, about that? Sorry? I can wait till the end. Well, if you, if you have it, throw it out. I, I heard that um, in lots of those cases, the arbitrators are uh, usually kind of biased for the organization that is enforcing what they need for the arbitrator. So, yeah, so the, the, the question or the, the concern is a lot of times there are reports of the arbitration service being biased in favor of the organization that, that proposes it. 
Um, one, one great solution to that problem would be, say, in an employment agreement, maybe the employer says, here are 10 arbitration agencies that we approve of, and in the case of a disagreement, the employee gets to choose among this set. Um, maybe so that there's more options for the employee, but the employer still gets to be satisfied. And we have a lot of, there's a lot of evolution of, of this type of idea that needs to happen, but we can vastly improve arbitration services if there's more competition, more demand for that, rather than relying on the state. There, of course, there are costs for, for paying arbitrators, arbiters, but the long-run cost to society of, of, of continuing with the monopoly arbitration service um, is much worse law in the long run. <clears throat> okay, so police and courts, and the final one is my favorite monopoly that I'm working the hardest to, to bust, and that is the, the fiat currency um, monopoly of providing money. So in, in basically every country in the world, there is a central bank which has a monopoly on issuing currency and we are compelled to accept that currency um, because we have to pay taxes, we're compelled to pay taxes in that currency and also um, I know with the US dollar, say I contracted with a friend of mine um, for 10 ounces of gold, I lent him 10 ounces of gold, he can come back to me when it's due and say I don't have that gold but I can pay you in dollars and I'll, I'm legally bound I have to accept those dollars. So there's, there's a coercive mechanism built right into our monetary system. And what this monopoly does, it gives a certain set of individuals the power to create unlimited wealth, or really the power to siphon unlimited wealth out of the productive economy, almost always used to finance wars. Uh, all wars in the last 100 years and even 200 years have been financed via monopoly currency inflation. Um, so how, are, how can we beat the, the monopoly currency system with technology? In the last um, 20 years, 10 years, we have incredible improvements in communication with the internet, and now we can actually use digital currencies um, I'm a huge advocate of Bitcoin as a, a private currency that individuals can use and control that um, central banks cannot manipulate the supply of that. Um, there are lots of other different currencies. Now that we have um, incredible software power, like uh, stock indexes are a better currency than the dollar because they hold value longer. And they weren't good money before, but now we actually have technology to be able to spend your stocks like, uh, and send them to PayPal accounts or spin them at, at places online. And we have technologies that can convert different types of value. Um, before it was made illegal in the 1930s, gold was um, the primary form of money for 5,000 years or so. And fortunately, it is legal now to hold gold and use gold. And we're far, finally starting to see technology that enables us to hold gold and spend it also to have different community-based monies. And so rather than trying to um, end the Fed, there's a big movement to, to audit the Federal Reserve or, or have legislation that, that regulates the, the mega banks. It will be more effective to create our own local community-based money or global money that is bound by, by physical rules such as Bitcoin as a fixed supply. Uh, it's very predictable. Centralized organizations can't manipulate it. So uh, hopefully these types of monopoly organizations we can see being torn down by markets and competition, different types of money instead of using dollars only. And especially, dollars are not the worst <laughs> currency. People all over the world deal with central banks uh, stealing their wealth all the time. So we're, we're seeing market solutions coming to help these people. And they're significantly breaking down monopolies all over the world. For that, I'm, I'm really happy. 
Um, I wanted to emphasize those three types of monopolies. There are, there are a lot of monopolies that in the past have been, um, they were state monopolies, now no one even cares, um, like airplanes and cars. Uh, or telephone used to be state monopoly um, in the, during World War I. Obviously there's tons of competition in telephones, we have better service. Taxis used to be a state monopoly. They've been replaced by Lyft, Uber, Sidecar, all kinds of competition. Marketplaces are the way to break down these monopolies. And with that, um, do you have any questions? Yeah, it seems like there might be a bit of historical oversight with respect to your comments about police emergency services and the direction that they've trended from being centralized now towards being less centralized in the future. The story of uh, fire services, for example, in this country it was entirely privatized. You had to buy a, a fire insurance, you had a seal that you put up on your building, and if there was a fire and you didn't have a seal, the fire department, there wasn't really a department, they would just let your house burn down. That was the norm. Police services also, in fact, started off as community watches who were entirely voluntary, and one of the issues they had going, that was about the 1600s, um, you didn't see the transition to a more state driven police system in the 1900s, and the reason for that. Uh, that that came about was because these sort of community distributed police uh, forces, community watches, were only good at reacting to crime after it happened, whereas it required a, a centralized pool of information uh, for preventative crime uh, issues where you needed to like, look out for people who were like serial killers on the loose or arsonists and things like that. And so it seems like they're sort of, it's not like we started these monopolies and we're looking for ways to kill them off, and instead these things came about as a reaction the sort of failures of these more distributed approaches. Absolutely. So, so the, the, the point, great point, is that we haven't seen a history where we started with state monopoly and now we're, we're evolving away from that. But rather, we had decentralized systems and we found, or people then found, that it was more effective to have centralized solutions. And the reason for that is um, the difficulty of communication in a decentralized network. Um, ultimately, the information at the edges wasn't, wasn't, they wasn't able to be coordinated enough, so they had to have centralized systems. However, we are in a, a different age where it is not difficult to communicate throughout distributed systems. We have, we have the internet, we have instant communication, and that can enable a lot of more great things. For instance, in San Francisco, there's the, the city, um, there's a city app where you can report um, people for various things. You can say, this, this person's homeless, they need help, or there's a, a, there's a crime happening right here. Um, that's all being piped to the, to the city government, but the internet can actually enable all of that information to be totally open and transparent. There isn't a reason why one monopolistic organization can take advantage of that information better, but the information does need to be coordinated and centralized. Right, so. so it seems like if you had competing police, privatized police forces, they would actually not have an incentive to share that information amongst each other for preventative crime purposes. Instead, they would be competing to get the business of you know, regular citizens by withholding information that might have put them in a better situation had it been shared out right um, perhaps, perhaps the, you, I, can, I can definitely see that argument. Competing police would want to hold back information because it would give them an advantage. Though, um, insurance companies would want to, they, they would have an incentive to reduce crime period. So they would, they would have an incentive to increase communication in, in that regard. And I think often insurance companies would be directly contracting with, with various police forces rather than individuals directly com contracting with police forces. Oh yeah, is gold is gold a step backward for um, related to cryptocurrencies, things like that? Well, the reason that people hate on gold so much now is because it is actually quite difficult to transmit gold. Like one ounce of gold costs twelve hundred dollars. Like you can't can't just spin that at at your corner store or whatever. Um, now we have digital currencies like Bitcoin, all kinds of other currencies. You can transmit them instantly. Even bank payments are faster than gold, right? But 
I think we're at a point, there are tons of technologies, including a, a, a product that I'm building, where you can hold gold but easily transmit it, its value also, by making all kinds of assets, especially gold, liquid to, to other types of assets. So you, to be able to instantly convert gold ownership into dollars and transfer them in a bank or convert it to bitcoins and transfer it, um, we're seeing a lot of ability to to use traditional assets more as a spendable assets. Though I, I emphasize competition. Um, some people want to hold gold for long-term stability. Bitcoin doesn't have much of a history of long-term stability and there's no way to to really assure that that's going to be very stable, though gold is extremely stable. So competition, I think, will, will give us the best money. Uh, we should probably... Uh, you, you have one question? Yes? Um, this is a lot of questions. Yeah, we, we have somebody who's waiting on Skype to come on in, so maybe later. Okay. Okay, thank you. So thank you.